Hi everyone. It's New York Fashion Week and we are going to explore what that has to do with science and what that has to do with me and you. Um, my name is Sarah Longo. I am from Pittsburgh. I have a background in entrepreneurship and biology and fell into sustainable fashion after being a lover of clothes for a very long time. Um, so I'm on the council here in Pittsburgh for Style 412 and I'm also the managing director for an air quality technology company called AirViz, um, which explores uh, ultra fine particle pollution in both indoor and outdoor environments. Um, and most recently, I'm a guest crew member of X Expedition, which is a UK based organization that uh, takes an all female crew to uh, sail across the world and do microplastic pollution research in our oceans. So, and then in turn, it's effect on women's health. Um, so this topic is uh, especially important to me because uh, I went through an egg freezing procedure last year, and this is actually uh, my first anniversary of my <laughs> egg freezing procedure. So I'm very excited to be having this conversation today. And I'm joined by two researchers from McGee Women's Research Institute which is the largest institute in the United States solely dedicated to women's research and reproductive biology. Um, so Judy and Miguel, would you please introduce yourselves? All right, thank you. Nice to join you, Sarah. I'm uh, Judy Yanowitz. I'm an associate professor and my work focuses on understanding the molecular basis of human infertility, but I model this in a microscopic worm because it can go from egg to adult in three days rather than 15 to 40 years. Um, and we're really trying to understand the underlying mechanisms that cause chromosome missegregation, which is the leading cause of uh, recurrent miscarriage and infertility. Wow. Hello, I'm Miguel. I'm assistant professor at McGee Women's Research Institute, and my lab works in how the, uh, how we can protect and conserve the quality of the eggs from the moment that they were created in utero to the moment that we need to use them, and how environmental factors could be affecting this. This could be radiation, could be uh, toxics, or could be things that are in the thing uh, in all the, in the water or the things that we eating every day. Great. And Miguel, you also have a background in design, correct? Well, during many years in Barcelona, I used, I used to have a, a one-of-a-kind boutique. So what we do is to do garments there. And what we used to do is also get the fabrics from um, leftovers. So we reuse what other designers used to create the, the one-of-a-kind pieces. Awesome. So fashion and science is, is something that... Um, it's merch in me and I love it. Right, I hear that. <laughs> so I have a bunch of questions to work through. Um, Miguel, maybe I'll ask you this one first. So what aspects of the fashion industry impact the environment? I think that there are many different layers. It's like from where the products that we are consuming every day are done. It's uh, because normally it's not in our countries or the countries where we are living. So it's how they're, do, uh, they're done or created the um, chemicals that they use to create it, and how this all these different aspects are influencing the, the health. In my case, in our case with Judith, we're in, um, interested in how these chemicals or other factors are in affecting the reproduction. Um, clearly, they're like uh, social levels, economical levels, but we that is not our expertise. And what we want to explore today with you is how those little things that we probably think that is uh, benign, uh, it could be affecting long-term your babies or the babies or your babies. Right, and sort of like you mentioned, the um, manufacturing and the distribution process for the fashion industry is pretty complicated. So we rarely see what goes into that. And um, when we receive our clothes, uh, much of them, I think 60% of all clothes are made from synthetic materials. So that's a lot of plastic. And um, I know when we wash those synthetic materials that they tend to shed in the washing machine. Um, so, and creating microfibers and microplastics that go uh, back into the water system and into our drinking waters. And it's that cycle there. So when it gets back into our system where we start to see the effects on um, women's health, right? So, um, Judy, can you talk a little bit about what kinds of effects these release plastic have on women's health? 
Yeah, so it's been known for about 20 years that the degradation of plastics can lead to the release of, say, bisphenol A. Um, and that's a strong uh, estrogenic compound. And we knew from studies originally by Pat Hunt's group uh, in mice and followed up by studies in many other organisms that this has major impacts, particularly on the process I study, chromosome segregation. And so even in animals exposed to bisphenol A directly, you can see um, impacts on eggs that had already been made. And this is what's really important that, um, that it can impact um, a woman's pre-made eggs by influencing chromosome segregation um, of those ones that have been held for a long time in, in the animal. And so I think this is uh, really important for us to study. And we also know that things like BPA for women's health can have an impact on breast cancer and um, because of its estrogenic uh, capabilities. Right. And some of those toxic chemicals can actually be found in a blood test. Is that right? Yes, exactly. And so, yeah. boy, I mean, more and more we're developing these tests to be able to understand them. The challenge is really proving which of the individual compounds. And so most of us are familiar with BPA-free plastics. But what's happened um, is that they've changed a methyl group and now they have BPS. And we now know from studies that BPS has similar types of defects, both on eggs and on cancer predisposition or disposition. And so it's not that um, just the switch of one compound to another made it better. I really think removing plastics as much from our diets and from our exposures um, is really important. Great. And um, I know even outside of textiles and our clothes, um, plastics show up in the fashion industry in beauty products and in packing material. So Miguel, at the beginning, you were talking about the manufacturing process. Um, can you talk a little bit more about where the plastics are found in the fashion industry? I um, think that they're all over the place. So uh, imagine that you're receiving a product that you buy either on Amazon or Target or Chanel. So the first thing that you get is like a massive box that is wrapped in plastic, that is wrapped with tape, that inside is another product with plastic, and then there's the bubbles and etc. So can you imagine how much effort create, uh, was put in there just to create the plastic? We are not talking the dyes or the things that are in the uh, fabric per se, it's just the plastics. And the first thing is like, um, probably 80% of the people are gonna take that and throw it away. So those plastics will go to the environment and then that's why we have the little fish bag uh, that is a plastic bag or straws in the uh, ocean. Right. And I'm not talking about production of that plastic. Right. So yeah. next step is how it's affecting health. Yeah. Something that I think is interesting is, especially in Pittsburgh, um, we never think of ourselves as a coastal town because we're not next to the ocean. We're quite far away from it. But we have rivers that flow down connect through the Mississippi which dumps into the Gulf of Mexico so we actually are directly connected to the ocean um, and like you mentioned those straws and the plastic bags and all this packaging material that we're throwing away uh, if it we're not disposing of it properly it can end up in the environment and as it travels down through those waterways they break up into small and you know they hit rocks and get uh, tossed around and so those bigger pieces of plastic uh, break into smaller pieces of plastic, and that's what makes microtoxins, right? Um, and then when animals eat those, and then we in turn eat animals or drink the water, then, right, that's how it affects us directly, too. I yeah. think that the fact that the microfibers is something new that we are re uh, already trying to know what is happening, but it's more probably as first thing is like imagine that plastic bottle that is in the water, and then it will be exposed to the sun, and when the, the sun hits that bottle, will be releasing BPA that was a toxic that Judy was uh, explaining. Right. So yes, it's really interesting to see how this could be break and generate the microfibers. But I think that probably the first like red flag will be with how these uh, plastics are interacting with water and sun and changing temperature and they releasing the chemicals because those chemicals will be affecting clearly the fish but also the people that is eating that fish. Great. Judy, did you have anything to yeah, add? So, so I want to say that the major way that 
that we as individuals are getting exposed to this is from the food and the water that we are drinking. So it's critically important that we think about the impact um, both on our oceans, because that's a food source, but also the lakes and our fresh water, water the microplastic are getting into the food that we eat. And, and that then is coming into us um, from fish, from meat, from uh, any, and our, and our watch normal, normal water so sources, excuse me. Um, and so this is really when we wash our clothes and those microfibers go in, they then can get back into us. And some of the problem is the breakdown, as Miguel mentioned. The other problem is that these microfibers are thought to accumulate toxins on their surface. And so other environmental exposures, such as, um, uh, like I said, oh, sorry, um, when we, well, fertilizer, yeah, yeah that was the word, right. um, in particular, are some of the things that are accumulating on these microfibers. So you shouldn't think of it just as the plastic itself and what's released from the plastic, which is actually critically important, but also that these fibers and microplastics are accumulating other toxins in the environment that are being exposed to humans. And they're small enough. I think the thing that we have to think about is that these are small enough to get across the placenta. Mm -hmm. And so microfibers and microplastics can get into the fetus developing in a mom. And so when we're thinking about this, it should, it's not just the impact on us directly, it's on the next generation and the generations after that. Because right. our children's reproductive organs are being developed. And so we, this is a very long-term uh, exposure that that we see in the present day. Yeah, that's a really important point to mention. Um, and that something similar happens with air pollution. So the smallest particles that we breathe in can pass through our nose hairs and um, get, you know, deep into our lungs and then through our bloodstream and into the placenta, just like you mentioned. So um, I read a statistic in 2019 that said uh, the fashion industry is uh, the second or third most polluting industry um, behind oil and gas, which is really scary, right? And part of that is due, a big part of that is due to the manufacturing process and what the water usage and um, the amount of toxins that are used to produce these plastic chemicals to make clothes and make packing material. Um, but another piece of that is how we, what our consumption is and how we dispose of that. So like Miguel was mentioning before, um, so really important things. So let's pivot a little bit, talk about what we can do about it. Um, so on an individual level, sometimes it's hard to think about how you can have a big impact on a problem that is so big. Um, so Miguel, maybe we'll start with you. What kinds of changes can we make to ensure a healthier lifestyle for ourselves and cleaner consumption for the fashion industry? Okay, cool. So I think that um, everything is trendy. So that is great. So. A new trend that Z generation is uh, adopting is the really, really heavily is um, go to thrift shops and give a second life to uh, garments, to clothes. And you can't imagine how the treasures that you can get in those stores, they're cheap, they're good quality, and you are helping because I don't remember the numbers, but to produce a pair of jeans, you need to consume, I don't know, 160 liters of water. So with this kind of a uh, new uh, behavior, let's say in that, uh, or trends, uh, we can save a lot of water, protect a lot. And for example, um, I, I, can, I can say that in Pittsburgh, there are different stores like that. And one of those stores, the clothes line, also get this kind of clothes, sell it, but all the, uh, the, the, the benefits from that store come to us in the Institute to help us to develop research. So it's like you're helping the environment, but also you are helping to the people that is working to create new knowledge and new um, advances to protect the female health. So I think that reuse is a really interesting part. Uh, if you, and you can make a total Gucci look from these kind of thrift shops like this. Uh, so that's a good one. Right? So. I walked into the clothesline um, like a year and a half ago, not really knowing that it had a connection to McGee Women's Research Institute. And I cheated a little bit because I knew we were going to talk about this. But <laughs> um, <laughs> so I got the coolest raincoat that comes, like you said, you can get like a high quality look, right? I mean, look at this thing, right? 
So, and I got this second hand. I was thrilled. Um, so, and that's one of the best ways to be sustainable in the fashion industry is to not only donate your clothes as opposed to throwing them away, right? But um, buying secondhand. Um, and I also know that Pittsburgh has recently been ranked as a top de destination for uh, buying vintage. We have a ton of options here. So we are perfectly positioned uh, to, uh, you know, shop sustainably and find really cool looks. Um, Judy, do you have anything to add? One. Yeah, so I think one of the other important things that we should consider is how much plastic just generally are we using. So if we go back to Miguel's point about the fashion industry as a whole, one of the things we can do is buy local, right? He talked about having a boutique shop. And so if we could support the businesses locally, we're going to significantly reduce the plastics that are used in the packaging. And I think that's one really important way that we can do it from the fashion industry perspective. The other is in the individual use in our homes. And so I, I'm one of these proselytizers of the stainless steel water bottle or using glass. Um, and you know, every day you, when you put it in plastic, the hot water is degrading the plastic that's in, in your water bottle and you're drinking it. And so I think it's really important to think about what you're actually ingesting all the time to reduce the number of plastics, to not microwave in plastic, to get rid of, if you are doing that, to switch it out every year, make sure you're not washing it too, too much because it's the abrasion of this that's actually increasing the, the degradation. Right. Um, so I also know, I know we mentioned the beauty industry earlier, but um, so if you check your beauty products, especially the face scrubs and the body wash that has um, the exfoliating, uh, beads in them. So often those exfol exfoliating beads are just plastic beads. Um, so I have started to go to the drugstore and check the, the back of the label to see like, oh, is this walnut or is this a plastic bead, right? Because I, I really don't want to be scrubbing plastic beads all over my face and then have them dump into the water system. <laughs> too. Um, so, and then another thing that, so we talked about microplastic shedding. Um, so in your dryers, there is using dryer sheets and there are filters and mechanisms to catch those smaller fibers and lint, right? Um, in the washing machine, we don't have anything like that. Um, so there uh, is an organization that sell, it's called Cora Ball, right? So they sell this, oh, I should have brought it here, but they sell this ball that has like this big and has little arms on it that actually catches the microfibers in your washing machine. So you throw it in with a load of laundry, um, and when you pull it out, it really does work. It catches hairs, it catches small fibers, and then um, that way they don't go into the water system. Um, and what so. do you do with the things that you get from there? <laughs> you, yeah, so you're supposed to dispose of them properly, so throw them away in the trash, uh, since we don't have a better way to do it right now. Um, but as you mentioned, like one of the best ways to uh, extend uh, to be sustainable in terms of fashion is to extend the life of the clothes that we already have since so much of what we own is made from uh, synthetic material. So mending and repairing our items, um, donating them. Um, there are now also collection bins even on the University of Pittsburgh's campus that will take textiles. So they'll take drapes, they'll take clothes, they'll take um, undergarments and all of that gets, they have a partner uh, who will take all of that material to be reused into housing insulation. So um, coming up with unique solutions to extend the life of what we already have instead of over consuming. So, and I love Judy's point about shopping local too. That's another massive thing that we can do. Um, so Miguel, any other best practices for buying clothes and other products that you can recommend? I think that the first thing that I want to say is is it's not bad to buy. So this is not a, a let's shame the people that buys. Yeah. It's let's think that there are like ways to do it, uh, try to be conscious and think that the fact that the t-shirt it's costing just three dollars involves that it was produced for one cent of dollar in who knows where. Mm -hmm. And to create that low price you are jumping many many legislations about toxics and about 
uh, many things that, that we don't really want to, so to go there. So it's be conscious with what you want to buy and try to recycle the packaging and try to give a second life of the clothes. I think that that is the, the easiest thing that we can do without spend too much time or with a lot of effort. And the other thing, if you give a second life to the clothes, it's that they will be unique. So no one else will have the same thing that you have. So that's, from the fashion side, that is a cool thing. That's true. I love that about shopping locally too. Um, so Style 412 right now is in towards the end of slow fashion season, which is basically a pledge between June and September to um, try to not buy anything new to, but if you do to buy from a reuse uh, store, a vintage shop or buy local. Um, so those are two of my favorite ways to do that. And then um, one of the ways that I check into uh, sustainable fashion when I'm looking to buy something new is to just read up on the brands. So for example, um, I really like J. Crew's clothes and I've made a conscious effort to go on their website and look at their policies for sustainability and see if they even have one, number one, um, but number two, what they say, right? And how transparent they are about their manufacturing processes and what they pay their workers and how they package their material. Um, so uh, there is an organization called uh, Fashion Revolution that publishes a fashion transparency index um, where you can get lots and lots of different information on uh, how sustainable these big brands actually are. So, um, Judy, anything else to add in terms of what we can do? Uh, sure. So I guess I think what you're really saying is that we should all be informed consumers. And so just like we care, just like when we go into a supermarket and we care what ingredients are in the food that we eat, we should give the same uh, look at the clothes that we're wearing and how that, that clothes is made or when we're buying it. So where is it made? Who's making it? And understand that um, sometimes we have to pay more for organic food and sometimes we may have to pay more for clothes that are made sustainably. And um, you know, we can say that plastics are bad, but they are pervasive in our society. And fortunately, the large plastics company recognize, based, because consumers are asking for this, that there needs to be changes. And they're starting to think about biological ways or combining it with bioproducts. Um, and we can see that in, you know, products like the North Face is now using that for its synthetic fibers. And so I think this is really um, an important way that we just, it's, we need to just be conscious of what's happening and, and read the labels and invest in the time and thinking about what's the company that's doing this and are they doing it sustainably. Right. Yeah, I like to say that cheap now could be really expensive later. So that $5 t-shirt will be like, you're, you're gonna use it three times and then it will be crap but also it will be affecting next generations. And I like to say too that um, don't be selfish and remember that the quality of the eggs of your daughter are created or done before they, her birth. So don't be selfish. Taking care of yourself is taking care of your next generation. Yeah, yeah, that's been really important for me who hopes to have kids one day, um, has gone through the egg freezing procedure. Um, so, Thank you both. Any last minute thoughts before we close? No, thank you. This was such a great conversation. Um, Miguel, I loved your last point there. I think um, I have been a lover of clothes for so long and loving clothes doesn't mean you have to have lots of them, um, but making sure that you buy smart and take care of what you have. So watch it, washing things properly, um, mending and repairing things, and then making sure you're buying um, natural fibers, right? Because those not only have an impact on us, but on future generations and have um, those synthetic materials have quite a long life. <laughs> so um, thank you everyone for joining today. We've uh, discussed quite a lot and received some great pro tips from these two researchers at McGee Women's Research Institute. Um, if you have a chance, stop by the clothesline. They have some awesome stuff. Um, but I hope you'll continue to learn and to help push the fashion industry to be more sustainable. So thanks, Judy and Miguel.
Gracias. Thank you.